The next speaker is Nancy Canwisher. Let me start with her official title. Nancy is the Walter A. Rosenbluth Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at MIT. Now let me tell you who she really is. How many of you have ever had a professor shave their head in front of you during lecture in order to teach you about neuroanatomy? Nobody? Clearly, you didn't have Nancy as a professor. How many of you have ever tattooed the EEG 1020 coordinate system onto your scalp? If you ever need to know, you're taking an exam, for example, hopefully you're sitting behind Nancy. Her lab at the McGovern Institute uses brain imaging to identify specific regions in the brain responsible for things like perceiving faces, places, bodies, language processing, and other cognitive tasks. Please welcome Nancy Canwisher. Hi there. It's great fun to be here. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, so uh, I don't have an awesome invention that's going to cure disease to pitch to you guys, but I have some cool data. So let's do that. Um, so uh, I can't see what you guys are seeing. OK, there we go. Um, I want to start by pointing out that um, our field of human cognitive neuroscience has made huge progress in the last few decades. To get a feel for that, let me show you approximately what we knew as recently as 1990. We knew the very approx approximate location of brain regions engaged in recognizing faces, processing language, and attending to things from the study of patients with brain damage, more or less that. And that was pretty much it. But then functional MRI came along, and here's where we are today. There are now dozens of regions of the cortex for which we have a really good idea of what that region does. And each of these regions is present in more or less the same location in every one of you. And I think that's pretty cool. I like to think of this as a kind of initial rough sketch of the structure of the human mind. Um, and I think that counts as real progress, but it's also obviously the barest beginning. So another way of looking at this diagram is it's just revealing a vast landscape of unanswered questions. So I want to mention a bunch of these that I think are important. Uh, one is, what is the causal role of each of these regions in cognition and experience? Next, what are the neural representations at a finer grain? What exactly is computed and what is represented in each of those brain regions? And how do those computations unfold over time? What are the structural connections of each of those regions to each other and to the rest of the brain? And how do, those inter how do those regions interact with each other online during cognition to produce experience? So the bad news is functional MRI is not going to answer any of those questions. But the good news is there's another method that can. And that method has been around for a long time, but I think there's a huge opportunity to turbocharge it right now and get it to answer those questions. And that method is direct electrical recording and stimulation of the human brain intracranially. And this opportunity arises in, um, in neurosurgery when patients have electrodes put inside the, the scalp, right against the surface of the brain, for clinical reasons, both to map out functions and to discover the locations of epilepsy, uh, epileptic foci so they can be surgically removed. Uh, so those patients are often in the hospital for one to two weeks, affording an incredible opportunity to get the most amazing neuroscience data from human brains. Um, and some of them kindly allow us to record from their brains while we show them pictures and play sounds and get them to do different things. And I'm hugely grateful for that. So to give you an example of how powerful this can be, let's take this first question. What is the causal role of each of these regions in behavior? So this person here is a lovely gentleman who was facing neurosurgery in Japan a few years ago. And I got a call from some collaborators showing me this picture on the right of the location of the electrodes in his brain uh, that they had placed the day before to map out functions. And for comparison, here's the bottom of my brain showing you in red my face selective regions that we had discovered 20 years ago. Uh, and some other regions that we've mapped out. And you can see that the electrodes in this guy's brain go right over the territory of those face selective regions. So I said, yes, of course, I want to collaborate. We sent them some stimuli. And you can see those, um, re those red traces show you the sometimes extremely selective responses of individual electrodes in this guy's brain when he was looking at faces 
compared to, in the other colors, lots of other kinds of stimuli. So that just validates the MRI results, showing that those brain regions are indeed extremely selective, selectively responsive to faces. But the real question is, what is the causal role of those regions? And so the neurosurgeons then decided to electrically stimulate all up and down that patch of cortex. And I'm just going to show you a short video of what happens when he's stimulated right in those face selective electrodes. So you see him looking at his neurosurgeon there with the lower right showing you, oh, there should be sound. He says, the face changed. Um, I don't know what's going on. Your eyes change. I'll just read what he's saying. Does everything change? The, neuro the neurologist asks. He says, yes. Do I turn into a completely different person? Well, your hair stays the same, but your eyes and your nose, I can't describe it with words. Can you do it again? He's such a perfect reporter. He's so thoughtful. Remember, he doesn't know there's a face selective region. He has no idea where he's being stimulated, but there you can see him being stimulated again as he looks at his neurologist's face. And he says, just this area of your face. Your face turns into a cartoon character, an anime. <laughs> Neurologist says, what about my mouth? Your mouth doesn't really change. This area, the nose and eyes changed. OK, now he's looking at a box. We want to know, is that region causally involved in perceiving things that aren't faces? So he's getting stimulated while he looks at the box. And he says, it doesn't change much. But for the first second, just for the very first second after it started, I saw an eye, an eye, and a mouth. He's looking at a box and seeing a face. How do I explain this? Just like the previous one. I see an eye, an eye, and a mouth sideways. OK, now he's looking at a kanji character. It's foreshortened, so it's hard to see. And he says, am I just imagining things? Can you do it again? One more time. OK, just as I thought, I see a face. Around here, an eye, an eye, and a mouth. So the point of this um, is that we can learn an enormous amount from human intracranial data. And my slides have disappeared, but that's OK. I know what I wanted to say. Um, so that's an answer to this question um, of what is the causal role of that region. Answer: it, The causal role is extremely specific to perceiving faces per se. Um, oh, good. Um, so what about all these other questions? Um, I'm just going to show you a teeny bit of data that addressing some of these other questions of what exactly is represented neurally in particular regions, and how do those representations unfold over time? So here's some data that Ev Fedorenko and I collected. The blue dots are from a bunch of different patients who had electrodes implanted in their brains for clinical reasons, and showing you in the blue bar the response of those regions when the uh, subjects read sentences. And in red bars, the response when they read a series of non-words, like mafer, that have no meaning. And on the right, you see that over the course of reading the sentence that has eight words, the activity in those language selective regions of the brain ramps up monotonically. We feel as though we're looking at the neural process of constructing the meaning of the sentence over time as it comes in. And you see in the red that that response doesn't go up at all if you read a series of non-words, even though that task is much more difficult because the subjects need to remember the entire string. Um, so that's one piece, uh, little bit of data from recording. Um, but more recently, we've been looking at auditory cortex, looking at responses to sound. And this is very topical for this meeting. Everybody's talking about music, and we are too. So we played lots of different sounds, nearly 200 different sounds to subjects. And we found electrodes with stunning specificity. So here's one electrode. We saw almost 200 of these electrodes across 13 subjects. And this one responds uh, in the light green when the patients are listening to little two-second sound clips of foreign speech that they don't understand. 
um, almost as high when they listen to native speech that they do understand, and medium when they listen to uh, vocal music. Okay, and so this is a speech selective electrode. It's not language, it's not about the meaning of uh, sentences, it's about the sounds of speech. Okay, and that's been seen by other people, but it's kind of cool to see and you can watch its time course. Um, but the real prize was something that has never been seen before, and that is selective responses to music. And so here in pink are the responses to vocal music, and in blue are the responses to instrumental music. And each of these is the average of 30 or more different sound clips, all of which showed the same thing. So this generalizes across a wide range of instrumental music, a wide range of vocal music, and you can see there's nearly no response whatsoever to other auditory sounds like dogs barking and toilets flushing and ambulance sirens, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is cool because people have been wondering for uh, centuries why humans even have music in the first place. Psyche like Louie mentioned this, it's come up a few times. It's a big puzzle. Darwin thought it was one of the biggest puzzles in human evolution is why mu humans even have, have music. And many have argued that music is built upon mechanisms we have for language and speech. But our data show absolutely not. They're completely dissociable in the brain. There's absolutely no response to language or speech in the electrodes that respond selectively to music. Music is its own thing in the brain. And finally, we found something that we completely did not anticipate, and that is that some electrodes are not only selective for music, they are selective for vocal music. And we think that's astonishing and fascinating. And Darwin also speculated that vocal music was the fundamental native form of, of music. In fact, he thought it, it um, and, uh, antedated evolution of language, that language was built on evolution of, of, of singing, uh, earlier development of singing. So the point is that with these methods, we can answer every one of those wide open next level questions about the human brain that we've been, I think, kind of stuck with with functional MRI. And so I think there are huge opportunities. Many people are pursuing this. And here at MIT, we have, a, I think, a great opportunity. There's a new neurosurgeon who was just hired at uh, MGH. And I think with MIT, MIT's expertise, we're gonna be able to really push this to the new level because we have great expertise in the human brain and in primate neurophysiology, but also crucially lots of expertise uh, with deep learning and um, signal processing and computer science that will be necessary to understand these signals and nanotechnology, people like Ed Boyden, I'm looking forward to him inventing all kinds of awesome new electrodes. So I think with, um, with this, we have a huge opportunity to answer some of the deepest questions scientists have ever asked about the fundamental nature of the human mind and brain. Thank you.